And we've now got a, we've, we've asked actually some of our colleagues to provide some commentary from their perspective. So we're going to go into this um, panel discussion that will be four two minute interventions. Um, what we want to get out of this event is actually to collate some key messages and key actions. And so I think we're, um, we've got those clearly from our keynotes. So without further ado, we will go over to the panel component and I will ask the, so the order will be, we'll have Gabby Hegel, who's the uh, co-chair of one of our WCIP Lighthouse activities, and then Regina, Regina Rodrigo, because I don't believe Greg Flato has been able to join us, and then Bruce and then Sabine. So Gabby, the floor is yours. Thank you. Morning, thank you. Um, so I, um, I don't want to add too much. The previous speakers have um, have highlighted the challenges very impressively. Um, I would like to point at the um, safe landing climb, um, climate lighthouse activity of the WCRP, um, which has been developed recently into an, an into a science plan. And the things we want to focus on are um, exactly the things that have been highlighted in the previous talks. So um, we want to um, in, ensure that we are on a path to better quantify climate risk. Um, that includes figuring out which emission pathways um, preserve habitability and food security um, and um, what are our limits to adapt. Um, we, we want to focus on better on risks of high probability, um, high impact, low probability events, including tipping points, large carbon release, and um, a lot of the events that have been highlighted in previous in, in talks this morning. Um, we would like to look at what um, climate implications of carbon dioxide removal would be um, while tensioning it against biodiversity, food and water supply, um, we would like to be better able to um, determine risk from a long-term redistribution of water, including the human impact, the direct human impact on water, like extraction, um, and, and particularly focus on the um, on the sustainability of glaciers and tropical rainforests. And then, uh, lastly, on coasts, what is um, um, what is the level of sea level we can adapt um, to? and what is its irre irre irreversibility. And the tools we want to address these challenges with are modeling and much better the interactions between um, various earth system components. How does the carbon, um, how is the carbon cycle impacted by extremes, um, vegetation change? Um, how does ice um, interact with climate on a more interactive, um, in a more interactive way? How, um, and particularly also highlighted by the previous talk, what is the interaction of society with all these things? Um, and we want to um, challenge the models with paleoclimatic and observational evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. And keep your camera on so that people can um, keep you in sight. And I guess the. Um, the sequence we wanted to go through here was to be very clear on the science and then go through to um, some of the um, some of the more um, engagement activities we've got, which Regina and Bruce will talk about. But I think it'd be really nice to see, you know, picking up from that and also Detlef's talk, how WCRP is getting itself organised to address some of these big science challenges that Johan and Helen um, told us about. So thanks, Gabby. And the floor is now with Regina. Hello, um, I'm Regina Rodriguez from Federal University of Santa Catarina, and I'm here representing the WCRP uh, New Lighthouse Activity Climate, uh, My Climate Risk. And, um, second, oops. and uh, so we have made great progress in climate science, and today we can comfortably say that climate change is real and is inequitably driven driven by human activity. Climate science also tells us that we should limit human-induced global warming to a specific level, and this requires strong reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Mitigation uh, to achieve our vital goals we know requires in turn global coordination and government policy. Uh, therefore, top-down uh, approaches to climate information serve as well for mitigation purpose. However, um, there is a wide accept gap between the production and use of uh, climate information for adaptation. It's also widely accepted that uh, at least part of the reason, reason uh, for this situation lies in the challenge of a bridging between top-down approaches to climate information on global scale and local decision context. Uh, uh, which is necessary to take a bottom-up perspective. We urgently need the climate change science to guide adaptation policies that will minimize the vulnerability of societies across the world by reducing exposure 
and sensitivity to climate hazards and enhancing the capacity of communities to proactively uh, adapt to evolving climate risk. We also know that many of the adaptation policies have mitigation benefits as well as the core benefits. So we needed to uh, grapple with the, the complexity of our local situations, our local reality. However, simplicity is important when dealing with deep uncertainty. Uh, we need to empower local communities to make sense of their own situation, which can be addressed by developing methodologies that build trust and transparency. Much of climate change science is necessary big science, but in order to make climate information usable for adaptation, it is also necessary to discover the beauty of the smallness. Uh, and this is what we propose with doing the WCFP new uh, lighthouse activity, my climate risk. And our take home message is we need climate change science for adaptation that takes a bottom up approach and considers the reality, but with simplicity and empowerment of the local community. This is very aligned with the words that Peter Glumpen uh, just said. So that's that's my message. Thank you, Regina. Um, yes, there's definitely um, some themes emerging. So um, you don't want to hear me, you want to hear from Bruce. So I'll hand over to Bruce now, who is co-chair of one of our new projects on regional information for society. Bruce. Thanks, Evan. Um, I'll try and get to my three key messages quite quickly in the interest of time. I want to take a scale question to information. Um, and this built very nicely on what Regina has been saying. Recognize at the global scales, we have lots of robust climate information, but weak action. Um, yet at the local scales of the impact where the individual makes decisions, we have limited robust information, but generally a willingness to act. And so we have a dichotomy here, a tension uh, between where the resources and the, and the resource decisions are made and where the impacts are happening. So if we were to reframe the question of emerging climate risks and what will it take to limit global warming, as what about the science is constraining the action at the decision scale? Well, this is where I want to speak from as a scientist who's been working in Africa for 30 years in the developing nation context and from the perspective of the WCRP Regional Information for Society core project. And I'm not going to go through all the details on this in the interest of science of, of time, but there are a lot of factors we can identify that magnify the climate risk at the local scale. Um, and we won't go through that, but I'll, I'll just summarize them in a few key messages about what the challenges are here. Firstly, if we want to act at the scale of policy and decision, and so manage the future of climate risks, firstly, we're actually not really lacking information. What we're lacking is context-relevant information. And the, uh, the, the need here is how do we effectively resource transdisciplinarity and real intellectual partnership between and within regions. And I'm talking about between developed nations and developing nations, and within the, uh, developing nations, the where areas are most vulnerable. And this is something that the uh, regional information uh, the society core project uh, hopes to facilitate quite strongly. Secondly, the power centers of the resources and research, research capacity are often not strongly focused on the most vulnerable regions and on developing the scientific capacity of the most vulnerable regions. Uh, we need to invest in the capacity development of these regions so that we can have locally informed decision relevant climate information. Uh, so the context relevancy of Nairobi, for example, comes in to the construction um, of the climate information relevant to decision and policy in the city. And then thirdly, we have a diversity of information sources from global models, regional models, and other sources that really confound the message and weaken decisions at the local scale because there are contradictions and differences between these. Um, so we need a strong research thrust on how do we reconcile these contradictions that are dependent on the method you choose for generating your climate information, and then evolve the communication modalities and practices that take this information into the context relevancy of decision makers and policy. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. And I, I hope that we're seeing some um, addressing of some of the challenges that I think Peter threw out to us in his keynote address. And on that, then, we'll go to Sabine, who is from Future Earth and has spent a lot of time thinking deeply about um, climate change mitigation and sustainable development. And so I'll invite her to the floor to give yes. her um, thoughts. Thank you. Thanks. Me. Thanks very much for the invitation and the kind introduction. So as we've seen in today's keynotes, there's overwhelming evidence now from the climate science community on the need to ratchet up 
ambitions to reduce uh, emissions and limit temperature increases in order to keep climate impact to a minimum and reduce the risk of crossing important tipping points. I think both Valerie's and Helen's interventions were very clear on this, and UN has clearly also underlined how these how real these risks have become, and that even at temperature increases that were headed for now, tipping points cannot be ruled out. In order to reach the ambitious goals that we have had, that we've set ourselves in Paris, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees global warming and also subsequent assessments have shown that we need to bring emissions to net zero by mid-century. Clearly, we're late with getting on track for this. So Detlef was very outspoken on this in this keynote. And COP26 will be key uh, for working on this. There are a lot of elements of the transformation that several speakers have already mentioned that are very clear to us, including exiting the use of fossil fuels, stopping deforestation, reducing emissions from land use, as also Johannes pointed out. However, apart from these obvious steps, there's also an urgent need for a discussion on how much we can reduce residual emissions on time and how much of the CO2 that we'll still be emitting in the process will have to be cleaned up from the atmosphere again. In most 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees scenarios, CO2 removal technologies already achieve significant scales by 2050, with up to 20% of today's emissions being removed through bioenergy coupled with carbon capture and storage, and up to 25% through reforestation and agricultural measures. This is no longer about mopping up a bit of CO2 at the end of the century with plenty of time to prepare for it. These are things that we'll have to get our heads around very soon. And clearly, further delays in climate change mitigation will only increase this dependence on carbon removal. However, comparing these pathways to what we see going on in reality, there is a striking gap both in innovation and policy, but also in terms of societal dialogue, the technologies and approaches to remove CO2 from the atmosphere that are currently prevalent in these pathways are very controversially discussed at the moment. Where should the biomass come from without jeopardizing other sustainable development goals if we are to scale bioenergy so much? How permanently can CO2 be stored in forests and other ecosystems if we look at ongoing climate change and what it has done to our forests just this year? What can be other approaches such as direct air capture, enhanced weathering, biochar, and other natural climate solutions? What can they contribute to come up with a more resilient removal portfolio that minimizes risks to other SDGs? And will the mere ability to remove CO2 be a disincentive to ratchet up emission reductions in the short term? Just these few questions that I want to put out there make very clear how urgently we need to have an agreement around residual emissions and how we can address them with CO2 removal. In the short term, it's about monitoring and certifying removals. It's about innovation funding and pilot projects. In the medium term, a clear governance structure is needed where concerns about moral hazard can be addressed by starting out with separate quantity targets and incentives for removals. And in the long term, a comprehensive carbon pricing architecture can help to reward and finance carbon removal while charging for the remaining carbon emissions. Putting on a wider lens than just carbon will be key here and will need to accompany a carbon-focused policy architecture with safeguards and regulation that ensures sustainability across the full range of sustainability concerns. And in this context, I did like Peter's intervention on the role that science can play here, and especially his note on the need of filling the knowledge gaps with actionable knowledge. So with that, I'd like to close. Thanks. Thank you, Sabine. And um, we will have to, I'll, I'm going to um, pass back to Detlef, we will have to close it um, imminently before the streaming service ends. Um, but a key theme that I see is the need to bridge gaps, whether that's between um, different kinds of science, but it's also with our communities, the people on the ground, as, um, as, as Bruce said, but also between science and the people that are making the decisions. But I really want to thank quickly everybody um, for, for, their, for their presentations, but I better not take our precious time. I want to hand back to Detlef to, to end this session. Thank you. Back to you, Detlef. Yeah, thank you very much, Helen, and thanks to everybody who actually did speak here today and all the people who actually uh, listened from outside. I think it is clear from all the contributions how urgent the problem is, uh, the, the climate change problem, but that it's also a problem of mitigation and adaptation together. We cannot deal with one alone. And I think um, uh, every, every contribution um, here provided very important messages and, and comments that um, just for everybody, we will actually collate and, and 
put together as a statement from this um, a brief um, event here, uh, but that everybody can read it afterwards. And I think a very important message um, uh, that came out from Peter and others um, about this actual information that, of course, Future Earth and um, WCRP has its mission to develop. Uh, but what Bruce already uh, or in particular pointed out, we really need to go to the local scale where the decisions are being made. And I think providing the information there might, in fact, speed up the whole the whole process, and that's what in the U.S. people call uh, where the rubber hits the road. We really have to get to that point where the societies um, need to act and will act and provide the, inf the information there. And with that, maybe we close the session. Thank you very much. Um, apologies for being over time, but apparently it's so important a problem that, of course, we can speak forever. Thank you, and um, a good day or a good night uh, for everybody around the world. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you and good day. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.